Non, non. Ok, on peut commencer. Bon Parce que oui, pardon. Parce qu'on est en direct. <coughs> so, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here and welcome to this session, afternoon session, uh, titled Changing Perspectives. Uh, my name is Jean Beauvais. I'm a professor. I'm a professor here at University of Montreal at the French Literature Department. Um, I'm, I teach uh, history and aesthetics of the theater, and I'm particularly interested in the theory and practice of voice in the theater. Uh, and I am also a member of the CRIAD, so I'm very happy to be here with you uh, today. Um, we will have uh, three presentations, um, and uh, each uh, presentation will be uh, will, uh, have a duration of 20 minutes, after which we'll have 10 minutes for questions and answers. As you know, the presentations are in English, but uh, the questions and answers can be in French, and I will translate if necessary. Um, so, um, I will first present uh, our, our first uh, speaker. It's, uh, her name is Katarina Nimea. Uh, she has completed a PhD in communication and media science at the University of Geneva and is uh, presently a senior lecturer at the Université Paris II Panthéon Assas and also a member of the Cent uh, Centre d'analyse et de recherche interdisciplinaire sur les médias. Um, the title of her presentation is Between Retro and Vintage, Digital Nostalgia and the Question of Authenticity. So, Katarina, it is all up to you. Uh, thank you very much. So, I hope that my English will be clear because I have some technical problems in my mouth for a while. <laughs> and it's the first presentation in English with this, so um, I hope it will be clear and uh, efficient anyway. So, before starting and talking, I wanted to show you just um, a video to give you some yeah, for, for digestion <laughs> after lunch. I won't show the whole, but it uh, gives you an idea. this we have the Epson printer but <laughs> so it was just said I will try to speak today about the question mainly of vintage but maybe explaining um, a bit in a more larger context why I'm interested in this like for several years now that um, I started working on the relations of media and nostalgia so um, why because simply I was like overwhelmed by seeing that with the new technologies finally there's a lot of nostalgic behavior on the web especially but also on television series films etc so i was intrigued by this because of course nostalgia is not new there's always been nostalgia waves in history and also the greeks already were nostalgic so i won't come back to this especially today uh, but i was intrigued by this idea uh, why is this so overwhelming and um, started to get a real interest in this and by working in switzerland at this time as it is a swiss notion um, I organized a conference eventually, and if you're interested, it's not to make an effort and um, anyway, the royalty is always whatever. It's, a, it's an edited volume on media nostalgia, 
So I just uh, share it, and if you're interested, I can send you the chapters of the colleagues, which are quite interesting or whatever. So you don't need to feel to, to buy it. It's not an advertising. I'm going to talk about the economical aspects also a bit later of nostalgia itself. So uh, what I will do today is um, very quickly to go over the notions and the relations of media and creative nostalgia. Then uh, introduce very quickly also the, the notion nostalgize. I did this in, in former work and I wanted to try to bring something new and bring everything together. I, um, I started to think about during the last years and then come directly to the notion of vintage, retro and digital nostalgia. So um, if we take a closer look at what has been said on nostalgia yesterday and today, but also more generally, we can easily observe that nostalgia is intrinsically related to the idea of mediation. This is also, I think, why I was interested when I saw the call for papers. Nostalgia is, at some point, and no matter if it is regressive, manipulated, political, personal, or romantic, something that is expressed by language, arts, cultural techniques, and artifacts, etc. I would have loved to talk about uh, the Make America Great Again nostalgia and the political nostalgia. We can also see the nostalgia of the Caliphate and whatever, so I'm more interested in this right now. But just to say that what I'm going to focus today is the more joyful nostalgia. <laughs> uh, so just to make the break immediately. So today, nostalgia and media are most of the time inseparable. And I think we could hear it yesterday already and the notion of media and what, how we define media. We are much more than in the communication or mass media section. So I think I don't need to say it here and I'm really happy about it. <laughs> um, so, um, of course, Media are always apprehended as being interwoven with social practices and well as historical and economical production conditions. And this is also why I became interested in the notion of vintage. As Löwenthal argues, I think this is um, a wonderful book. I think most of you know it. It's called The Past is a Foreign Country. As Löwenthal argues, and I quote him, we crave evidence that the past endures in recoverable form. Some agency, some mechanism, some faith will be enable us not just to know it, but to see and feel it. Um, media interfere in what Löwenthal calls agency or mechanisms and can also concern faith. In other words, nostalgia has always been an affair of mediated processes within counting literature and arts, but also when it came to the healing of nostalgia. The main examples of cures are given by Bolzinger in Histoire de la Nostalgie, based on medical case studies between the 18th and 20th centuries, are returning home or having the promise of doing so, receiving a visit from family or person with the same accent, and music that evokes, and memory, evokes images and memories of the homeland. For example, in the case of the Swiss mercenaries, the Ranz de Vache, the Swiss soldier song. Of course, it would be too easy to say that the media, products or practices could replace these old medicaments today, which help to heal nostalgia. But perhaps they pro provide a sort of cure, temporarily comforting the homesick. Because nostalgia, and this is what I was interested in, is finally something, a search for belonging, for a time, but also a space, a place. Um, and which is currently all still existing, but it got out of the medical discourse. I won't do the history of nostalgia because it is no more in this medical discourse right now, but it still exists. I give just an example of some soccer players who came from Italy uh, to Great Britain and one of them couldn't play. He was unable, he was homesick and said, I, I can't play, I'm so homesick, I can't work in this sense. And um, he told that he's better when he's Skyping with his family, etc. And there's a sort of mediation and communication with his family. And of course, I think maybe those who work on nostalgia also uh, can see that it's quite present actually in, in psychology, but also people working a lot on intercultural communication, immigrants, um, immigration and whatever. Um, but the, the reflections on media communication and nostalgia, it's just like really that the focus is on media in a more larger sense, not only television or literature, etc. cetera, not for such a, such a long time. And I want to, to, re, to resume this like immediately, but you can ask questions, of course, later to this, because I will go very fast through this to speak um, immediately then on, on vintage, is that media produce contents and narratives, not only in the nostalgic style, I mean the aesthetics, but can also be triggers of nostalgia. I think we have seen this also the last days, of course, um, with some examples, etc. Media and social networks, can help to attenuate homesickness. Homesickness, but uh, in nostalgia in general, there, I just thought there's a um, 
colleagues in psychology in Southampton who worked on this at Nostalgia is today more something constructive than something destructive. So it is, um, uh, and also a universal feeling because of course those who uh, come from Brazil or elsewhere know the notion of saudade. In German you would say Sehnsucht. So, um, and what was for a long time related to the idea of a post-colonial emotion that was a creation of the Western world. It's a work of uh, Alistair Burnett who's in um, geography uh, of nostalgia shows that it is really a universal feeling that is shared universally but of course it has different declinations in every country or culture and not to forget that media are often nostalgic for themselves their own past their structures and contents and i think we could see within all the presentations from yesterday and today either the keynotes or in the panels that of course there is in in something that persists so I won't come back to all the vocabulary about it's a survivance or whatever, but something is that, that stays or remains. And of course, media and new technologies in particular can function as platforms, projects and places and tools to express nostalgia. So this is a notion I, I, am, I just uh, got to develop quickly afterwards, it's nostalgizing. And so, Basically, it's uh, just the synthesis of the introduction of uh, media and nostalgia, to, uh, to give you the reference. And nostalgia, in turn, offers a reflection on mediation, media, and their related technologies. So before coming to the third point already, which will be the longest one, of course, of my talk, to vintage retro and digital nostalgia, just to insist that nostalgia is not only something we are or feel like, and it would be more than only a cultural product we consume, admire, or write about, it is instead something we do actively as a cultural practice, either superficially or profoundly alone with family or friends or on a larger scale with media. And of course, on a collective sense when it is um, abused, exploited, but I don't talk about this in detail. Today. In this sense, the regressive, progressive, double-sided nostalgia that emerges in the light of capitalist and politics interests is not the only form nostalgia takes. The notion of family, along with its social imaginations and developments, is raised and alludes to a complex relationship with former times and identities. This is one of the results um, in the book with uh, all the different chapters that we came together, that even if we are uh, in the question of, uh, of films, literature, there's one very nice chapter on the, on the nostalgia of Senghor and the emancipation, um, like post-colonial nostalgia, etc., etc. All the different chapters came to the same result that is, of course, this question of belonging, but also of a family, not in the traditional sense, but uh, in a more larger sense of community, maybe. I don't know if this is a good word, neither. But. So it hints as a search for a place of belonging and recognition, not in the sense of a home sweet home, a country, city or nationality, but in the sense of a solidarity and lessening of loneliness that might emerge by nostalgizing. It may be an aerologism, it isn't mine, it was a, a journalist, an American journalist in the New York Times 2013, but it is not as new as we might have thought, and, we should be critically, and it should be critically related to the concrete actions it can provoke and the objects it can create. Media and new technologies occupy this delicate position of involving and provoking all varieties of nostalgias. This, of course, also generates problematic issues I will point out later. So, one tiny part of uh, the, the work um, I tried to do on nostalgia to think about was um, the, the question of vintage. It is a, 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 here in the European Journal for Media Studies, there was a special issue on vintage. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to write about vintage and media. And then I started working on vintage. And I was like, this is a strange, something doesn't function here because the definition of vintage and ret retro frequently leads to the confusion of both even in well-researched scholarly works. I will give you an example. Heike Jens, she writes in a very interesting uh, work, retro implies the construction of past images and historical looks which can be achieved with original objects as well as with new ones that look historic. It uses the potential of dress as a cultural signal of time and an important component of cultural memory, historic consciousnesses and imagery. So she's a specialist of fashion, of course, that I had to read a lot about fashion industry, etc. because the notion of vintage is very used there. Um, so there's the reference. And then we find, just one year later, um, just to, to, to point out uh, this confusion that exists, there are uh, Venstra and Kupas, also working on, on vintage fashion, <coughs> say, who quote Jens by trying to define vintage and saying Jens defined vintage as a construction of past images. So they use 
Jens quotation on vintage, uh, on retro to, to use it to explain for, for, uh, to become vintage. So this is like something we find all the time. So I was like intrigued by, uh, by this. So the origins of the notion are of course related to wine. I think you always, those who are specialists in oenology, they know this. A good vintage is the, the product of a special place and time. Um, I, I, took, I worked for, I think, six months in archives uh, to see where this comes from and what it meant. And in the beginning, vintage was not related to the past. It was a present period of wine and the harvest. And well, you can, I can give you the reference if, you want, if you're interested in this. I didn't want to, to be too long and historical today to show more examples. But this original meaning, devoid of nostalgia, because it comes quite later, also exists in other research domains. Vintage models feature in scholarly fields such as economics, marketing or management, and computer studies. And the notion has even been used to describe changes in terrorist organizations. So I tried to make a work more to see where vintage is used or not at all. Vintage was primarily about sustainable quality and functionality rather than physical appearance. In the middle of the 20th century, aesthetic perception, sometimes including a nostalgic view of an item as being of the past, became equally important. It is also interesting to consider the taste or aesthetic appreciation has, of course, often been part of labeling vintages, as a description of wine or car demonstrates, but quality, functionality, and technical performance were much more decisive than aesthetics in the beginning. To name one example, it's a book from 1956, and uh, the title is From Veteran to Vintage, A History of Motoring and Motor Cars from 1884 to 1914. So, you know, you become a specialist of cars when you work on vintage. Karlslake describes how the veteran car model becomes one of vintage, stressing that, I quote him, in the primitive era, everyone is so vitally concerned with making a new object work that in some fashion or another, they can with no thought to external appearance. So once a vintage technique or model functions, then you start really thinking about the aesthetics. Of course, that has changed since, but in the, in the initial definition of vintage, that you can find. Today, vintage is mainly something that we created in the past, and whose qualities remain in the present, despite or thanks to signs and traces of the passage of time, material deterioration of color or changes, for example, but also narratives that locate and authenticate the item is being of the past. So we have something that we already had yesterday that it's a relation to stories that we tell around objects uh, or, or contents that count uh, when, when it comes to the questions of authentic authentication of the product. So vintage emergence when a particular manufacturing process, be it an artisan's workshop or a more industrial scale, produces or creates an item of lasting quality that is based mostly on high-grade production methods and techniques. In light of this, one may assume that vintage can easily trigger sentimental or nostalgic feelings about past places and times of better quality. This is not some completely untrue, but warrants deeper exploration. And then when I had listened yesterday to the talks, yeah, I got out an old photograph from my grand-grandparents and I don't know much about it because I've never gotten stories told because of the war. And um, yeah, I reproduced it last night, put it on the, on the, on the slides later. So I wondered myself, is this making me feeling more, tri triggering a nostalgia more because I can touch it, I can maybe smell it. I think it's a, it's a picture from, from, yeah, from the 40s, I guess. Uh, I even don't know it. Or um, is it more about the idea that this place or that these persons existed and they are related to me? So just um, maybe this is something we can discuss later, the question of the materiality of conflict. So I see that time passes. But um, vintage gained its symbolic and commercial value in the post-industrialization era and was part of social distinction, or at least the social technical aesthetic selection process until the early 20th century. Later, it reached its period of mass commodification with the neoliberal globalized capitalism. An analysis of vintage shows that the phenomenon can be considered as a sort of crystallization of social change, but the current temptation to make links between nostalgia and vintage do not fall in line with the initial rhetoric on the letter. The work in archives I tried to undertook revealed the relationship between vintage and the regret, regretful feeling towards the past during the Second World War. To give one early example, it's Benjamin introduces his Vintage London, so it's a book with his pictures about Vintage London, in 1942 with the following words. words. This is a breast. The London shown in the illustrations to this book has ceased to exist. Vintage London is of the past. It has disappeared altogether, swallowed a long time ago by gaping gullets of private property, big business and municipal progress. 
So a nostalgic tone can be identified here, but the archival research reveals that the direct linguistic bond between vintage and nostalgia emerges in the press and literature um, only at the end of the 1960s and goes on to explore the 1990s, mainly in the press, in the field of vintage fashion. This reveals a kind of sentimental bond with quality products and production methods of the past, or simply with the past itself. Vintage, of course, enters a new era with the emergence of digital cultures and two types of nostalgia can be observed simultaneously in this context. Nostalgia for the analog and nostalgia for the digital, namely the first vintage digital objects or programs. Of course, I won't come back to what yesterday was said by Jonathan Stern, but also others about what is analog, what is digital. You can really see that was the example in the beginning of the computer, that there are a lot of manifestations of a nostalgia that concerns the first, the early digital world or the we have the retro gamers there are, uh, there are a lot of forums and groups coming together about the first machines and of course it's not only about the content or what you can see or what was this um, the idea of the aesthetics of it but also the rituals around it the social practice practices the stories which were told around the object so and um i have many more pages but i will try uh, to, to to bring it together uh, in the last two or three minutes what I want to say is that analog vintage items transport pastimes in the material aspects to the present day, as Super 8 cameras, for example, and we was talked about this yesterday. In the sense, vintage items are a kind to a remnant ruin that travels, circulates, and takes part in the present as a concrete materialization of the past. But vintage does not to, no, does not to be expensive to be real vintage, because people want to sell us a lot of time vintage for very, very expensive money. <laughs> It's social, it is always related with social, economic, and cultural meanings, depending on the value and symbols that are attributed to them. That doesn't mean that retro items that are produced cannot become vintage later. The vintage is really about a process and a perduring. So becoming vintage takes time. Um, I will cut this, but maybe I think uh, you can ask uh, the questions uh, on this later. So um, to conclude is, of course, vintage items do not always trigger nostalgia. You can love objects about the past. It doesn't mean that we are nostalgic, but often the media industry wants us to be. Also, if you see what is going on in, uh, yeah, in, in the film production, television series production, the remakes, the revivals, it's the idea of transgenerational memory that we want our children, that they love the same things we loved before. I think Twin Peaks is just one of the examples. So I could have talked just about this today, but I wanted to go to this idea of this digital nostalgia. So uh, maybe to conclude is that an old video game device or an animated GIF, and then I am, because I had a lot of other things to show, I showed you the make pixel art you can do online. And I tried to do it. I'm not so dedicated to draw. So that was just uh, the picture reproduced that it is yesterday. So what I wanted to say, is that nostalgia for the digital is a yearning for the early vintage digital culture, a longing for the human relations it created and the object it produced, as for the analog nostalgia, every kind of nostalgia, actually. So um, those on the computer screen, but also the devices. Follow, to, follow two completely different uh, examples was the make pixel art here that invites users to recreate the 90 pixel style for free, but also use this type of nostalgia for commercial commercial purposes in order to sell applications, because if you really want to draw, you have to pay. And um, another illustration is uh, the, the quite recent pessimistic blog post of the Iranian Canadian blogger Hossein Derakashan. After six years of imprisonment, he misses the golden age of political blogging without the importance of likes and Twitter, etc. It's not only about the aesthetics, of course, also of the way of uh, being in, um, in political um, uh, application. So from social networks to blogs, and website, the nostalgia for the digital is actively expressed, practiced, but also commercialized. In this sense, it would be too blinkered to consider vintage nostalgia and their related narratives and techniques as mere commodities or simulations. They are ultimately part of our everyday life, but we can play with and contest them. This active nostalgizing or at least playfulness with vintage media grants us the possibility to reconsider the relationship between human beings and digital objects. It can also lead to an active engagement and confrontation with Freud's idea of Vergänglichkeit. It was can, translated in English with transient perishability. I know that in French it was uh, translated with passagerté. This fear and joy of the ephemeral and the irreversibility of time 
is certainly one of the reasons why humans undertake efforts to conserve layers of time by restoring, repairing, encoding, and copying objects of the past. Some people might even anticipate their nostalgia of the future by thinking of new devices that would be able to store and produce the nostalgic memories yet not occurred. Media to be taken here as a non-deterministic way as techno technological devices, which were equally interwoven with production conditions and social cultural agency, users and practices, generate content and form an undeniably part of the struggle to create and make and disappear, remember and forget. So I suppose that nostalgia will keep all its meanings, but we are not at all equal to experiences as the access to former times or future visions is never guaranteed. But thinking all this, I would even say that behind or in between all this different, sometimes confusing and commodified to nostalgia, we could also be nostalgia, nostalgic of the first animated GIF, <laughs> nostalgia is, again, what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I had some more videos. Thank you very much for the um, Sorry. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So, Marcello first. And then... Oh, you're back. Yeah, my, student, uh, my students told me that uh, they, they were worried about me because I didn't ask uh, uh, as many questions as I used. So, I, I start with that. Uh, so, uh, on. <laughs> thank you very much, Catherine, for your presentation. It's very interesting. and. Uh, Actually, uh, anticipating the presentation of uh, Jean-François, uh, which will be on uh, nostalgia <laughs> too. Uh, my my question, because you uh, you defined uh, vintage, you defined uh, uh, retro, but you didn't uh, uh, really define nostalgia. So, what's nostalgia? And in particular, my question is um, the structure you you are, you are mentioning is more about time, but uh, the the uh, as I discussed with. Uh, yeah, the, the first, the original uh, concept of nostalgia is based on space, is uh, going uh, and uh, coming back. Um, so, um, yeah, of course, I haven't talked about this today because I thought I don't want to remake the same uh, again. <laughs> I was in other conference before nostalgia. Um, yes, of course, in the beginning, it, uh, the, the, the notion itself, of course, is known by Omer, of course. Uh, but the term itself was uh, coined by... Um, um, by a, by, sorry? Jean-Jacques No, it was no. even before, in 1688. <laughs> 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 Write this down! Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was in 1688 uh, right. by, uh, by Hofer in Switzerland, and this was, they're making the joke about that I got interested in nostalgia in Switzerland, there must be something in a mood there. <laughs> um, and it was about Swiss mercenaries, so uh, in the army, leaving the country. And it's interesting also that um, the, the author of Heidi was inspired by the nostalgia literature. So, uh, uh, the, of course, the soldiers became sick and they died. So today, normally, you don't die when you're, uh, when you're nostalgic, luckily. But what is interesting is that they couldn't completely separate the relation of melancholia and nostalgia in medical discourse. This is why Boltzinger showed that I had the, if you're interested in the history of nostalgia, he's, he analyzed um, all medical dissertations between the 17th and uh, 20 first century in the beginning, where he shows how it got out of the medical discourse. And also in this sense, space. And uh, the, the, the reason why space now is less present but should come back, and we had discussed this yesterday already a bit, the notion of space on nostalgia, is that um, is the, it's Kant mm -hmm. was against Rousseau. Rousseau was saying like, no, it is about this temporal aspect. And if you go, uh, so no, it's the other way around. Rousseau was saying, if you come back, you're healed. So this is strange because when they got home, the soldiers, they were healed. But Kant was saying it's more about time and uh, our youth and we are missing our youth. And then in the medical discourse, yeah, it got out and it came into popular culture. And so the notion of nostalgia is today really like very negative and in a negative connotation. And I try to battle a bit against it, even if I'm of course a critique. But uh, to go back actually what you're saying, and this is why I think and assume that the current nostalgia boom will, will, will live is more about the real nostalgia or authentic, always in truth, of course. Mm -hmm. Nostalgia that, yeah, and for example, to give one example is uh, Donald Trump abused of the real nostalgia of the people who voted for him by using another nostalgia for an idealization of the past. I don't know if this answers the question, but I'll try to be quick. And you have to interrupt me if I talk too much. There was one question here. Yeah, um, thanks for this uh, very rich uh, intervention. 
you make the distinction between uh, nostalgia for the analog mm -hmm. and uh, nostalgia for the digital. But do you think there's something like a uh, nostalgia for the future? I mean, in the 70s, you had uh, American and English authors mm -hmm. like uh, T.J. Ballard, uh, Pynchon, Reutigern, and uh, Philip K. Dick, who were very much influenced by the post-war climate in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tapped into a sense of longing for a future that maybe never arrived. So do you think there's something like this tension? Yes, you're absolutely right. People thinking that nostalgia is just about the past. It's this idea of regressive nostalgia. I absolutely share what you're saying. But thank you very much because um, that was somewhere else here and I didn't have time to say it. It is in for, I'm not always completely um, happy with what, with what was Svetlana Boim said. It's a future of nostalgia she wrote. It's a very, very nice book and she really did a great work concerning the idea of regressive and reflective nostalgia in politics but she didn't talk so much about media. And you're completely right, because most of the time, the nostalgia, when we experience it in the present, it is about the past, but it's especially to cope with the present and maybe to have or create a better future. So I think it can be more when it is used in a positive way and the works in psychology show it, but also the latest empirical works we, we try to do on nostalgia because it was a bit theoretical here, but we try really to work on it. I say we because we are, I'm not alone doing this. And the future is really, really important here because especially ecology, you have, there's some one article, maybe you could be, uh, would be interesting for you. It's in Davis, it's in the memory studies section and he wrote on sustainable nostalgia, the idea that we try to protect the environment to create a better future. And so he's not nostalgic of the future. We could never live, but we do it for the afterworld. I think there was also a notion that come uh, along a lot. So I completely share what your, your comment here. Thanks a lot. Another question, yes. Thank you for a great paper. Uh, I was thinking, you, you mentioned uh, a few times something of, I might have misheard, but something I think uh, well, digital nostalgia and analog in mm -hmm. any way, any kind of nostalgia. So these kind of generalizing ideas of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. At the same time as you, of course, pluralize nostalgia, your writing and so on. Uh, so is there a historical specificity to nostalgia? And is there a local specificity? nostalgia and is that interesting to look at? Uh, is the analog nostalgia the same as the digital one? Is nostalgia today the same as it was say 50 years ago? Or is, is there a historical specificity to the various nostalgias would you say? It's, a, it's a, one of the most important questions people ask when or we get the, these questions working on nostalgia because it is very very difficult to answer because nostalgia is works on an individual level on different in small groups as it works on a collective level on a societal level in pol politics rhetorics economy um so the question maybe i try to answer with an empirical study i'm doing with um, emily kitley right now on um, on digital nostalgia which is in the digital world by digital nostalgia i mean a nostalgia that can be expressed concerning the analog or the digital itself as i try to show uh, very quickly there is something which is universal, as I tried to say in the beginning, uh, uh, and this is Alistair Burnett who has shown it because he was working in different geographical areas like uh, in, in India, Asia, uh, Latin America, Europe, showing that the feeling of it is shared universally and this was contested for a long time historically. Um, but then, yeah, of course, in the, the, the shift was to get, to, that it got out of the medical discourse. Uh, in the end of the 20th century and uh, I, I don't really have an answer to your question if I, I think it's really still something maybe in this sense an authentic feeling we might have or believe to have even with the question of authenticity we want to uh, um, yeah, resolve it today um, but I think it depends on where you are positioned as a researcher because uh, we get now interested in the economies of nostalgia uh, which is not at all my field in the beginning. I'm not in economics, but I try to understand a bit because there is a lot about how the producers or those who are behind um, uh, yeah, nostalgic products, how they function and how they think that others might be nostalgic, but maybe they are not and that there's a resistance to it. And you can see it online in some, on some platforms that are really like bus feeds of nostalgia. And then that people finally tell their stories and they know it was not like this. So we are into something like this right now to see how these, how 
the, the confrontations of different sort of nostalgias. I don't know if this answers because it's a very difficult question. Thank you. So if you have any more questions for Katarina, we'll save them for the end. We'll have time, I think, for a general discussion. And we will now hear our second uh, speaker, Marina Merlot, uh, who is a PhD student here in comparative literature and who works uh, particularly on the selfie. So we're uh, not right in our time. Uh, so Marina, uh, Marina's intervention is titled The Selfie, Understanding Mediation Through the Lens of Narcissism. Thank you. Um, I seem to be squeezed between two papers on nostalgia. Um, <laughs> so it's okay. The selfie will offer a counterpoint to uh, nostalgia, I think, because there's a lot of discourse about the newness of the selfie and how it's a contemporary phenomenon. Um, um, so I'm at Straight Hype, and after being selected as Word of the Year in 2013, the term selfie was officially added to the Oxford English Dictionary in June of 2014. Selfies are now everywhere, and most people have a general understanding of what a selfie is and how to take one, even if a specific definition of the practice is sometimes difficult to maintain. To this day, these self-portraits are the subject of much social criticism. In journalistic, academic, and social discourses, the practice is associated with youth culture and most often with young women. Selfie taking is frequently seen as pathological or antisocial behavior in the contemporary age, and it is tied to new technologies and um, to the digital in general. Scholars have yet, though, to seriously consider the selfie within media theory, as the social and technological dimensions to the selfie draw more attention. As I will demonstrate here, adopting a media studies approach to the selfie doesn't mean disregarding these multiple aspects of the practice, but it does place the selfie within a broader range of media practices from which to draw comparisons and establish differences. And this ultimately leads to a better assessment of the selfie's supposed newness and specificity. My talk today will therefore use the selfie as a case study for understanding mediation, and it reflects sort of the general approach I adopt um, in my doctoral research. More specifically, in this presentation, I will show how the selfie helps us think through this idea of authentic artifice and the interplay between transparency and performance. I will argue that it, is, that it is a salient case study for understanding these divergent models of mediation, the ideological values we attach to them and how they paradoxically work together. So through analyzing a case study, I will begin by showing how the selfie problematizes these divergent models of mediation. And I will propose some theoretical concepts to describe the tension between authenticity and artifice that the selfie exposes. Then I will tease out some broader implications to this media studies approach. I argue that this approach can firstly better our understanding of the role of the body for the selfie and other media practices. And secondly, it offers a reappraisal of the critical potential of narcissism in understanding the selfie and other uh, self-representational practices. Um, so in 2013, the advertising agency Lowen Partners created the series of images to promote the newspaper, The Cape Times. Historic, iconic photographs of famous people are modified uh, to make the photographs look like selfies. So there are a few different examples um, with a couple different slogans. Uh, every story feels like a firsthand account, know all about it, and getting you closer to the news since 1876. These recreated selfies bear witness to the cultural currency of the selfie form. It is clearly being used here to sell. It promotes and brings extra value to the Cape Times. And this cultural work is almost entirely done by the selfie image itself, since the slogans are 
quite minimally displayed. These artificial selfies also offer clear points of reference, since we can compare the selfie form to the non-selfie form, sort of the before and after image. And this allows us to identify the added value in the selfie. The framing, composition, and scale of the two versions are quite similar. But the single inclusion of the selfie gesture, seemingly crossing the picture plane, completely transforms how we interpret these photographs. Jackie Kennedy seems more alive. She's performing for the camera. And the viewer feels implicated. And the selfie effect has everything to do with the way the selfie mixes both authenticity and artifice. On the one hand, these selfies claim to bring you closer to the news, making it feel like a first-hand account. Such proximity supposedly bypasses mediation, going directly to the source. This is Jackie Kennedy photographing herself. There's no extra photographer doing that. It therefore feels like we have immediate access to something we don't normally see. In these advertisements, the Cape Times foregoes the traditional model of objective journalism in favor of something more intimate, up close and personal that is represented by the selfie. On the other hand, it is precisely this subjective viewpoint that also brings artificiality. Jackie is shown photographing herself, calling attention to this mediation. The selfie gesture ostentatiously shows the process of its taking, turning Jackie's, Jackie's gaze into a knowing and complicit look. Indeed, the selfie taking Jackie knows she is on display. She's orchestrating sort of like mise-en-scene or performance. The selfie effect then is to have it both ways. The selfie has a snapshot aesthetic that offers a seemingly transparent immersion into the photographer's life. Quickly captured and quickly shared online, selfie is photography on the go. However, the selfie is also always about performance. It is an image of the gesture and pose of self-portraiture. Never accidental, the selfie's authenticity also comes from this overt showing of the process of its taking. So before moving on to the ramifications of this authentic artifice of the selfie, I'd like to briefly propose three theoretical concepts that help describe this selfie effect. Um, Serge Tisseron coined the term extimacy to describe the mix of intimacy and exhibition, um, particularly in online settings. And he warns against seeing online sharing uniquely as a form of exhibitionism, underlining how the dialectic between intimacy and display is very formative for the subject. And I think extimacy is a good way of describing this effect of feeling closer to Jackie while still being aware that she knows she is on display. Secondly, I think it is helpful to describe the selfie effect as a form of attraction and to tap into the rich scholarship on the early cinema of attractions. Jackie's arm reaches out to us, drawing us into the image, implicating the viewer. It organizes the space between the viewer and the image, establishing a face-to-face -face relationship. And with this setup, Jackie's gaze can be compared to a film actor's look to camera. Like in this famous example of the great train robbery, Jackie's look to camera draws attention to the photographic dispositif, sort of startling the spectator. Questions about the spectator's experience, the role of the technological apparatus and the user's interaction with it, as well as the idea of monstration versus narration. They're all discussed in relation to attraction in cinema. All these questions are relevant for the selfie as well. Finally, the last theoretical concept that helps describe um, the authentic artifice of the selfie is indexicality. 
Paul Frosch makes a compelling argument that the selfie forces us to rethink photography's indexicality. He urges us to distinguish between the index as trace, which is sort of the more common understanding of photographic indexicality, and the index as deixis. So in linguistics, deictic language points to things, emphasizes, um, draws attention, and it is context specific. Uh, so words like this, that, here, now. The selfie too says, look at this, look at me, here and now, in sort of a deictic form of indexicality. So I don't have time to discuss uh, these theoretical concepts further, but I think they illustrate how the theme of this conference really ties into a number of different and long-standing discussions um, in a broader field of media studies. And what is so interesting about the selfie is that in an age where technological marketing strategies consistently insist on immediacy, immediacy and transparency, um, the selfie as a practice forcefully demonstrates that the two regimes of mediation, transparency and performance, or if we want to use both or in Gerson's terms, like immediacy and hyperimmediacy, that these two uh, regimes cannot be easily separated. Selfies offer an important counterexample uh, to the common misconception that mechanically produced images in general and images in the digital age in particular are somehow divorced from the body. A media studies approach to the selfie is a good way of interrogating this importance of the body. Indeed, Hans Belting argues that the body itself is a medium. So he says, firstly, I quote, I do not speak of images as media, as is often done, but instead of their need for and use of media in order to be transmitted to us and to become visible for us. Second, I would contend that our bodies themselves operate as a living medium by processing, receiving, and transmitting images. So for belting, images are immaterial. They need a host, a vector of some form of support. Um, the image is disembodied and therefore requires media of some kind to circulate. Once embodied, the image becomes a picture. Our bodies therefore also function as a host to mental images. It is only thanks to our bodies that we can process and receive these images, as well as transfer them into other host media. This mediality of the body is at the very core of selfie practice. Selfies are necessarily pictures of bodies. And the bodies shown are in the act of representation, both because they are taking a picture, so carrying out the transfer of an image to a new host medium, in this case, photography, and because they are posing bodies, functioning themselves as representation, sort of as a canvas, so to speak. More specifically, Yves Citon situates gestures more than just the body um, at the heart of mediality. Gestures are at the interface between the self and the outside world, and they are fundamentally unstable. Their status perpetually oscillates between that of sign, so as an intentional mediation, and that of symptom as an unintentional material trace. Indeed, the selfie gesture is voluntary, controlled, artificial. It functions as a sign. Examples like this photograph, taken from the viral meme, hashtag selfie Olympics, uh, remind us that taking selfies is not natural to the body. <laughs> Paul Frosch explains that, I quote, it is an acquired skill. It requires practice and the calibration of the body to technical affordances and desirable representational outcomes. Yet the sensation of transparency, of a direct access to the photograph subject that we described in the first section, also underlines our lingering attachment to the photographic medium as material trace, and therefore the selfie as symptom as well. For Paul Frosch then, the selfie is a gestural image, and as such, it proposes a particular kind of sociable interaction. 
inviting the viewer to, I quote, look, be with, and act. He says the selfie, sorry, he sees the selfie as fundamentally social. And so it is to this aspect that, um, let me turn now, but through the concept of narcissism. Narcissism is a very helpful lens through which to consider the idea of mediation, the role of the body, and the relation between the self and the social world. But it cannot be simply understood as pathological. And this is often the case when <laughs> discussing selfies. Some high profile selfies are consistently championed as illustrating antisocial behavior um, and insensitivity. So like a common example are the Holocaust selfies or like the selfies taken at the Holocaust Memorial or um, selfies taken at funerals. Um, more generally, Narcissism is a recurrent cultural critique made by social historians like Christopher Latch already in the 1970s and more recently against millennial culture um, by Jean Twenge and W. Keith Campbell's book. Yet considered as a theory of mediation, narcissism takes on a more relational and positive understanding. In her book, Narcissism and Its Discontents, Julie Walsh claims that narcissism is a theory of the environment. If we return to the myth of narcissus, it cannot take place outside of a specific setting without a certain type of interaction between narcissus and its surroundings. As a theory of the environment, Walsh explains, narcissism calls forth a questioning of the boundaries between the self and the world around it, its other. And this uh, questioning of the boundaries happens between two extremes, the self as world and the self in isolation. In this relational narcissism, the boundaries between self and the outside world are tested, blurred, established somewhere in between these two extremes in an ongoing process of subject formation. With this understanding of narcissism, we're really at the heart of the theme of this conference. These two extreme situations, the self as world and the self in isolation, correspond to the two divergent models of mediation. Indeed, the self as world is a transparent self, one that does not require mediation, since there's no difference between the self and its surroundings. On the contrary, the self in isolation depends on mediation because there is no overlap whatsoever with the outside world. In this way, as a positive theoretical concept, narcissism allows us to tie the authentic artifice of the selfie, the way the selfie problematizes divergent models of mediation to philosophical questions of subject formation. The mix of transparency and artifice in the selfie is the symptom of narcissism doing its work in the negotiation of boundaries between self and social surroundings. The selfie is an image taken at the cusp of this relation where the self is knowingly invoking the other's gaze and responding to it. So I'd like to briefly conclude uh, by opening up some avenues of reflection towards other practices and other media forms. Narcissism, as I showed earlier, is a recurrent critique and part of a larger discourse that pathologizes media and its users. This is particularly true for representations of the self, um, in autobiography or in self-portraiture, but also um, for self-reflexive works. And there's something really fascinating in this discursive tendency to fear and to want to control the relationship between self and other that occurs through media. What I attempted to prove today is that the authentic artifice of the selfie shows that this is not some trivial fear. It is indicative of something really fundamental to media studies. Consequently, there's a lot of work that remains to be done in uncovering all the historical understandings of narcissism, in understanding how narcissism functions discursively, and in analyzing the dual role of performance and mise-en-scene on the one hand, along with transparency and authenticity on the other when mediating the self across media. Thank you very much, Monica. So, questions?
Yes. Yes. Since the body is at the center of your focus, I was wondering if you made the difference between the dif uh, the, the different ways of taking selfies. Like you can use your computer, you can use a mirror, you can mm -hmm. you can like make this gesture, you can use a selfie stick. Uh, so the first question is, do you uh, did you think about these these different? And, but the second question related to that is. Would you say that one of these modality is more or less authentic or seen as authentic? Like if you use a selfie stick, you don't, sometimes the illusion is that it's not a selfie. Yeah. So is this selfie becoming less authentic because you hide, you hide your, you hide your gesture? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great question and one that I consistently sort of struggle with. And I think it's related to how we define selfies. Um, I think the gesture is very important and I sort of theorize that gesture and I think what that gesture brings to the image and I think you, you can see it in the case study I showed. Um, the term selfie sort of carries with it the ramifications of that gesture and so when we apply selfie to all sorts of images sometimes that are very different sometimes where you don't see the face where it's just a I don't know, picture of your feet or picture of your latte. People say it's a selfie. Um, I think it's because we have all these connotations with this sort of selfie effect that I tried to describe. And those connotations sort of linger when we apply that term to other practices. And so I think that I, I theorize a lot sort of a classic selfie or a very typical selfie. And it's like, the one I showed with Jackie Kennedy, where you see the arm. Um, I think it's important that you see that it's a selfie. And I think, yeah, a selfie stick sort of denatures that. Mm -hmm. You no longer have the same effect. Um, but I think that in a lot of the, these different types of practices, we're still holding on to a little bit of that selfie effect that stems from those classic selfies that, we're so, that we have seen and that we, we do know how to interpret. Mm -hmm. Answers your question. Yeah, of course. I may. I just have mm -hmm. a comment on that particular example because, yes, there is this arm reaching out, mm -hmm. and, and you you uh, described it as a, in the selfie effect as a phenomenon of attraction. The arm reaches to us, but actually that's very deceptive because it just doesn't reach at all to mm -hmm. us. It's the person reaching out to her, to her or himself in a way. If she had pointed her finger at us, that would be something equivalent to the image of the guy putting his gun. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think there might be something... Uh, a difference there? Well, maybe something to... to uh, there's a paradox, actually. Mm -hmm. There's the effect that it's in a, a reaching out, but it is not. It's a closing in. A closing in, but that um, taking a selfie, you're very aware of... Yeah, that it's going to be... A return gaze, yeah. yeah. But it's not display. in the gesture itself. It's um, no, but maybe in the look or the, yeah. the look towards the camera. You're already thinking you're about the person. That's true. That's true. The response. And, and if you see the screen, um, you're seeing also what the viewer would see. We'll see the way you'll see. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, um, yes, you're not pointing out, but I, I think there's sort of a tension kind of between mm -hmm. that's established between the spectator and the image through that gesture and like pulls you in and pushes you away too. Um, you're kept at a very specific distance. Um, and I think the idea of attraction sort of helps describe that tension. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> Just keeping on the same uh, uh, question about uh, different kinds of uh, selfie and especially linked to the idea you were mentioning at the end of your presentation about uh, um, the self as an environment or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, what is the, the, the place and uh, of the device? Because I mean, we can have, uh, uh, we can take a selfie with a reflex. And actually, uh, we had re uh, selfies before ante literam, before selfies with reflexes. Uh, the problem was that uh, you are not able to see what you are 
doing. Uh, and uh, after uh, selfies boom, uh, devices adapted uh, in order, so the um, selfie stick, for instance, but also just the fact that you have a, a double camera on uh, all our devices, uh, so you can uh, see yourself in the LCD the, um, screen. So what do you think about this kind of, uh, does our self produce uh, itself in this uh, um, loop with uh, a device, and uh, this is a kind of uh, environment. So for a Narcissus, the, the, the mirror of the water mirror was crucial. And uh, for, for us, this is the mirror of ourself, um, our soul. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's the, the idea of the Maurizio Ferraris when the, uh, he writes a book about uh, um, iPad and uh, and soul so, yeah. and saying that uh, yes it's the mirror of uh, of ourselves mm -hmm. uh, for this reason. Um, I think the idea of a theory of the environment should be extended to sort of visual environments in general today and and online environments because I think the difference between sort of historical selfies with, I don't know, Polaroid or whatever, and selfies today is that there is this environment where they're shared frequently. Mm -hmm. And you take, generally, you take a selfie with the objective of sharing it. Um, and so I think, yes, the, the specific device is important, but it's also sort of the general media and visual environment mm -hmm. that, that creates the selfie. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. There's another question right there. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I wanted to ask you a question in relationship to what Bart says about um, photographs always being about death. Mm -hmm. Death is always involved in the photograph. And um, one of the things that I'm working on is the idea that the selfies have a different relationship to death than other photographs. Um, yeah, I think it's also Serge Tisseron that writes about that. Who does? Um, Serge Tisseron, um, mm. I think in one of his blog posts, um, who says that, yeah, uh, photography today isn't doesn't have that same uh, nostalgia, actually. And that, yeah, do, but like selfies are an example of, yeah, where it's more about life, where it's more about the process, the present. Um, so yeah, I I haven't really sort of thought through that idea too much, but yeah, I, I agree with that sort of general premise. Yeah. Another question. Mm, since you talked about um, an environmental selfie, and you're trying to also pro problematize uh, the identity representation we carry out with a selfie. What's about the, the phenomenon uh, of, say, uh, the miserable boyfriends forced to take photos of their girlfriend? That is a stereotypical representation, a, a gender representation. Yes, but the fact that sometimes we take selfies uh, via another person, by another person, to produce our identity, and the photo itself is considered as a selfie, but there's another person that had to that has to do what we ask her to do. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that doesn't really qualify as a selfie. I know that um, that term is used to describe those types of pictures, but I mean, I think any sort of photography in the digital age, like food porn or um, outfit photos, you know, anything can be a selfie then if it's taken with a cell phone and like shared on social media. Um, and I think that's sort of an interesting idea, but um, it's too broad. So I'd really try and think about the selfie and the gesture. And so I focus more on examples where it is the person in the photograph taking the image. Um, not because those are the only selfies or that I'm attached to a sort of strict definition of the selfie, but just because it's really hard to think about the selfie and, and what it means without some sort of original example. So I kind of try and describe that original example as artificial as that may be because people taking these pictures aren't thinking this is a pic of me and this isn't a selfie. 
um, but to try and describe sort of the popularity of these images and like what they mean to people. One more question. I think there was one. Was it there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to hear you on um, the notion of indexicality. The dimension of pointing towards something where you distinguish between a trace and takes this uh, context and uh, uh, maybe spatial reference. Um, in Engels' Phenomenology of Spirits, uh, he analyzes the different uh, uh, appearances of knowledge and sees, uh, tries to determine how they could qualify as science. One of the first shapes of knowledge he analyzes is perception. And uh, the way we can actually, by words, by, yeah, by words, using words as pointers, uh, refer to something specific. So I was wondering if in the context of the selfie, mm -hmm. you would see a kind of gesture as more like um, uh, referring to a particular object, this is me, or more like to something of a something more general, like a subdivided sensible continuum uh, in, in the sense where you, have, you always have a sequence of selfies. I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. one isolated selfies, mm -hmm. but all these selfies create this kind of narration. Yeah. Um, I think maybe both. <laughs> um, I think there is, if you look at just one image, that sense of like pointing and showing and something really context specific, sort of a sense of present um presentness um but yes i think it's also a narration especially because it's a bit of a movement through that gesture it hints at the fact that you know it's time moves on and that, that there are maybe several pictures and that this person stopped briefly to take a picture and there was a before and after so i think yeah there's probably a little bit of both okay thank you do we have like here, just we're waiting for an adapter yeah, um, sorry, ah you have one wonderful oh, bravo <laughs> philippe <laughs> I think uh, uh, it probably should work. Uh -huh. I'm the computer specialist. No. The, the only one. I'm the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, who is So, Jean Francois Perriot is a PhD student here at the University of Montreal in the Department of French Literature, Department of Literature de Langue Francaise. Um, and his research is centered on the intermedial dynamics at work in the concept of nostalgia. So we're back to nostalgia. Uh, and uh, the title of his presentation is, is it this will kill that? Uh, it's all written. No, it's all, not all written. Nostalgia and Media Dynamics in Notre Dame de Paris by Victor Hugo and Luc Lamondon. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Bovet. Um, so, 
I hope our uh, presentations won't overlap too much, but we we'll, we could discuss about this uh, later. So looking back uh, to the first days of this conference, there's already been many things said on the topics of, the, of nostalgia. It seems indeed that nostalgia is a subject that lends itself perfectly to discussing those authentic artifices that, gives, that give their name to this event. I hope with this talk to maybe add something to this ongoing discussion, or at least to throw something in the mix and see what sticks. First, I'll try to present nostalgia as a dynamic, and this dynamic as an act of mediation, before diving into the case study that is for this talk, Le Grand de Paris by Victor Hugo. We will see how this dynamic of mediation is intertwined with the way the book discusses media, especially the relation between architecture and print. Lastly, and sadly, very briefly, I will discuss how this dy the dynamic of nostalgia can reiterate itself through the adaptation by commenting on Luc Plamondon's Notre-Dame de Paris musical of the late 90s. But before going any further, let's see what we can understand behind the word nostalgia. Composed of the prefix nostos, going back home, and the suffix algos, pain, the word seems to be of Greek origins and fits to describe Ulysses' quest and moon throughout the Odyssey. However, as we discussed earlier, <laughs> the word is nowhere to be found either in the Iliad or the Odyssey, nor is it present in any other work by the ancient Greek poets. We know, thanks to many historical researchers, that the word appeared for the first time in the 17th century. In Swiss. Yeah, I said uh, but I had the wrong uh, doctor's name here, so <laughs> that's that. Uh, as an attempt to describe a pathology observed in several soldiers who were back from uh, the front line and were longing for their homeland, as we said earlier, an illness cited as being so powerful as several mental, several severe, sorry, mental traumas. Or from a medical point of view, this disease had a cure, going back home. But through time and usage, meanings and understandings of nostalgia have migrated. Now nostalgia is conceived as a pain of the mind rather than simply a pain of the body. Therefore, nostalgia was dematerialized, moving from a matter of space to a matter of time. As Linda Hutchin explains it, I quote, nostalgia was no longer simply a yearning for to, uh, to return home. As early as 1798, Emmanuel Kant has no had noted that people who did return home were usually disappointed because, in fact, they did not want to return to a place, but to a time, time of youth. Time, unlike space, cannot be returned to, ever. Time is, is irreversible. And nostalgia becomes the, reac the reaction to that sad fact. As one critic has succinctly put this change, Odysseus longs for home, Bruce is in search of lost time. The shift is significant because it removes the re requirement of linearity, closing the present as the time of the return and not the future. To put it simply, I will return becomes I return, as the mind does the voyage and not the future. With this understanding of nostalgia, we can propose a very simple, this is a large simplification of nostalgia, I know. Uh, but a, a sort of a, of a draft of what we would call a dynamic of nostalgia. As you can see, this dynamic is defined by the interrelation of time, what is or what has passed, memory, the motionless act of going back, between the objective and the subjective, the real and the imaginary. Nostalgia can then be understood as the dialogue between these poles, but we must, however, recognize, for now at least, because this is exactly what Nathan de Paris would put in perspective, as we'll see later, but we must recognize for now the precedence of present in this dynamic. Nostalgia, as Hutchin noted, is much more informed by the present than it is by the past. As Katharina Lemayer explains, what is gone can only be reenacted, repeated, reconstructed, reshown, rethought, and restored by an artificial act by mimesis. In other words, what is past comes along with the present via representation, a present that contracts parts of, its, of the past in its actualization and can also include imagination of the future. Nostalgia is, therefore, an act of mediation. However, if, you, if we move this dynamic to the paradigm of fiction, the frontiers between time and memory, between present and past, can be rethought. And Victor Hugo's Notre-Dame de Paris proves to be an interesting case in that matter. But before going to that, I would like to point out where and how we can identify a dynamic of nostalgia in Hugo's novel. The narrative posture of the book can be defined this way. The narrator, living in the 
1830s, no, oh, sorry, uh, 1830s, yes, is at the time, as, at the same time as he is telling the story of Quasimodo, Esmeralda, Frollo, etc., is reflecting upon the changes made throughout the centuries to the city of Paris, specifically con uh, concerning its urban planning and architecture. He argues that time, revolutions, and especially men have nearly destroyed everything that made the capital unique and united, leaving the city in ruins as a shadow of its past gothic, gothic grandeur. He then proposes to his reader a journey back to the year of 1482 as he, uh, that he identif identifies as the golden age, as a time where Paris was still to be made and not, as he argued, remade. <laughs> <laughs> it is through these discussions on architecture that, uh, that we can observe the, this uh, nostalgia, nostalgic dynamic. Nostalgia is more often than not a comparative hack that tries, uh, that tries to make sense of the present by questioning and investigating the past. It is, in its core, a search for coherence in front of a present that seems disjointed and fragmented. We can see the comparison through the narrator's eyes. I quote, the Paris of the present day, the Paris of the present day has then no general physiognomy. It is a collection of uh, specimens of many centuries, and the finest have now disappeared. The capital grows only in houses and what houses. At the rate at which Paris is now proceeding, it will renew itself every 50 years. Thus, the historical significance of uh, its architecture is being effaced every day. Monuments are becoming rarer and rarer, and one, of, and one seems to see them gradually engulfed by the flood of houses, or fathers at a Paris of stone, or sons without one of plaster. To put this in comparison uh, with its depiction of uh, 15th century's Paris, I quote, Paris was not then merely a handsome city, it was a homogeneous city, an, ar uh, an architectural and historical product of the Middle Ages, a chronicle in stone. It was a city formed by uh, two layers only, the Romanesque layer and the Gothic layer. Could go on and on and on, but let's just point out this, that this uh, imagery of the city as layered is especially evocative because nostalgia can of, often be regarded as a wish to peel back layers added by time, natural layers, or by human artifice, cultural layer. Each, each layer seeming to be one too much, distancing ourselves more and more from the origin, the core, the pure, the real. But nostalgia, as Paul Grange pointed it out, must be driven by, I quote, a sense of discontinuity. Most of the time we can indict and identify within the nostalgic rhetoric a, a past point of fracture that caused the end of the proposed golden age, that created a before and an after, which defines the present sort of broken field. In Hugo's historical narrative, the invention of print is designed as the slipping point. This idea is condensed in a simple sentence pronounced by the character of Claude Polo, Archdeacon of Notre Dame, that is later discussed in a full length chapter of the novel. This will kill the. Sorry. I missed the slide, sorry. Um, this will kill that, the book will kill the edifice. The narrator gives, in the second chapter of the fifth book, two interpretations of that sentence. One is that print and the democratization of knowledge that comes with it will undermine theocracy as a social organization and the edifice of organized religion. Thus, the press will kill the church. The second interpretation, and perhaps the most interesting for the matters that we discuss today, is the fact that printed book has replaced architecture as humankind's main media and cultural, of cultural and historical expression. In fact, Hugo writes, uh, from the origin of things down to the 15th century of the Christian era, inclusive, architecture is the great book of humanity, the principal expression of man in his different stages and de of development, either as a force or as a mentality. From the moment that print becomes a cheaper and faster, and faster way for humankind to tell its story, the decline of architecture begins. To put it in Hugo's term, humanity switches from adhering to a Bible of stone to a Bible of paper. For him, the fact that architecture is no longer, I quote, the social art, the collective art, the dominating art, explain why, explains why his uh, fellow contemporaries have very little consideration for preserving and, most of all, not altering the monuments of the past. Thus follow the idea that printing will kill architecture. 
But why long for these things of the past, as he said? Why does Hugo own architecture in such high regard? It seems to be because architecture of the 15th century in his vision had the capacity to unite both the idea and the form of the idea within it. As it said, uh, as it had said, as it had, sorry, as he said that um, architecture represents, I quote, the love of an idea and the love of the form of that idea. In a paper concerning Hugo's perspective on print, Max Milner wrote the following, I quote, what is not only the real progress, but the real mutation that introduced the invention of print, it is decidedly the divorce between the thought and its medium. Or in the, in the chapter, this will kill that, the reader witnesses the depth of this oneness of form and content, as buildings are now depicted as empty shells, and books are said to be formed by uh, ubiquitous yet mediatized thoughts. It would be easy to simplify Hugo's stance on architecture by saying that he longs for the stability of the edifice in contrast to the printed book that he compares to, I quote, flock of birds that scatters itself into the four winds and occupies all points of air and space at once. But it would be forgetting that uh, uh, what he admires the most about the Cathedral of Notre Dame and by, extent, uh, by extension, the 15th century's architecture it is the fact that it is, I quote, an edifice of transition. Notre Dame, I quote, Notre Dame is not, moreover, what we can call a complete, definite, classified monument. It is no longer a Romanist church, nor is it a Gothic church. This edifice is not a type. In many ways, the church constitutes a sort of middle ground. It, its open character allows the union of all other arts under its tutelage, I quote. All other arts obeyed and placed themselves under the discipline of architecture. They were the workmen of the great work. The architect, the poet, the master summed up, uh, sum up, summed up in his person the sculpture with, uh, which carved its facades, painting which illuminated its, his, his windows, music which set his bells to pealing and breathed into his organs. Thus, Notre Dame is not only a media for all media, but a media conjecture, to use the term coined by uh, Jean-Marc Larue and Marcelo Rosetti. The printed book is closed, finished, so much so that it can be uh, mechanically replicated. The edifice is always yet to be done. Architecture for Hugo is not a product, it is a space of relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but deprived of its role as an art premier, Hugo also many times praised its primal character. Architecture is condemned, according to the narrator, to repeat itself. I quote, farewell all sap, all originality, all life, all intelligence. Architecture drags along a lamentable workshop mendicant from copy to copy. If original thoughts, invention, and posterity have now migrated to printing, we know that the repetition and the copying that Hugo reflects upon are fundamental to the print device. Although the author, the author praises the Gutenberg Press as, I quote, the greatest event in history, the mother of all revolution, the fact is that the novel presents, architect, presents architecture as being on the side of invention and printing on the side of repetition, a sort of way of implying that humankind is doomed to repeat itself. Of course, there lies a paradox. Hugo uses the print media to repair and restore, two terms that he often uses. Architecture, to bring back to life the ancient Paris, the one that is untouched by time, revolutions, and restoration. This brings us back to the dynamic of nostalgia that, as I exposed it earlier, past is only accessible through present. Thus, architecture can only be restored by the book. But let's add to that paradox. Notre Dame de Paris is a severe criticism of every attempt to restore the monument of the past because the present touch only, as it only is said to damage and spoil them. But what is this novel if it's not a restoration? There is no doubt that Notre Dame de Paris is a return, but a return that is the logic of the novel unbound from, weight of, from the weight of representation. Explain. Nostalgia, as it presents itself in Notre Dame de Paris, is not only an affective dynamic, it is an effective one as well, where memory and time are now dissolved into one another in a form of memory that we call performative. What is depicted in Notre Dame de Paris is not, of course, the author's memory, as the setting of the, for the novel precedes the state of birth by many centuries. The memory is thus objectivized. 
The restoration that it proposes is not the touch of the, uh, of the present on the past, but the resurgence and reparation of past itself via the mediation of writing. Hugo takes a contemporary, contemporary reader on a walk through 15th century Paris, and there's not a shred of doubt and hesitation in his writing and depiction of space and urban field. The first pages of the novel are particularly interesting in that regard. As he proceeds to uh, describe the Grand Hall of the Palace of Justice as it would, as it would have appeared in 1482, Hugo writes, if it could be granted to us, the men of 1830, to mingle in true with those Parisians of the 15th century and to enter with them, jostle, elbow, and fold about into that immense hall of the palace, which was so cramped on the 6th of January, 1482, the spectacle will not be devoid of either interest or charm, and we would have about only us, uh, we would have about us only things that were so old uh, that they would seem new. With the reader's consent, we will endeavor to retrace in thought the impression which he would have experienced in company with us on crossing the threshold of that grand hall in the midst of that tumultuous crowd. Just a few pages later, after a comment on the decay of the building, he proposed to take the reader back to, I quote, the veritable grand hall of the veritable old palace. Through a storytelling device that constantly reminds the reader of its presence, the novel is aiming for both memory and temporal immediacy. To use Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin terminology, the opacity of the narrative posture aims for transparency which allows time to be restored. This explains why, in this communication, I have decided not to, only refer, to only refer to the novel by, by its original title, Le Colombe de Paris, and not by its translated one, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, because, through a performative memory, the book is the cathedral. If, as you will claim, the cathedral of stone is now gone, here is the cathedral of paper. This brings me to discuss the matter of adaptation, the Grand de Paris having known many since it's released. One of the most famous ones is uh, Quebec songwriter Luc Plamondon's musical adapted from Hugo's novel, first presented in Paris, Paris Palais des Congrès in 1998. While the main argument of the show differs from the novel, Plamondon tackles issues regarding immigration, presenting Esmeralda. Clopin and all the members of the Court of Miracles as refugees, rather than reprising Hugo's rant on urban planning. The tone of the show is bleak as well. In its very first song, The, Ages of, the Age of Cathedrals, proclaim, uh, proclaims an end to a world. I quote, but it is doomed the age of the cathedrals. Barbarians wait at the gates of Paris Fair. Oh, let them in these pagans and these vandals. A wise man once said, in 2000, this world ends. In 2000, this world ends. And I will spare you with uh, an audio uh, <laughs> sample. Well, I would have, while I would have uh, much to say about the use of the term vandals, I will only uh, point out uh, the, that the contemporaneity introduced by this last sentence echoes to a sense that the viewer has throughout the show, that the cathedral that Plamondon refers to is not the cathedral of stone, but the cathedral of paper, Hugo's Notre Dame, as a symbol of a time where it was still possible to tell stories. There is then a switch in the original dynamic. As, as now the book is placed on the side of invention, and the show, and its inherent reiteration, is then on the side of repetition. If this is, I agree, quite an expedited example, it nonetheless demonstrates that nostalgia is not only a feeling contained in an object, but a dynamic that can be moved and reiterated, never mind what terms stand for time and memory. Thank you. I was um, thinking about the idea uh, of the, the, the conflict between the, the, the architecture and the book. Um, that, uh, and, and you pointed out later that all this is mediated by writing. That in 
these kinds of these reference in, 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 in messages. It's often so that what is perceived as a contrast when it's still written. I mean, Hugo um, is is a writer, so the question would be, what what uh, what does he gain by referring to architecture? What does he gain for his own writing? by stressing the speciality of architecture? Um, um, well, not sure. I'm not sure I, I quite understood the question, but I'm, there's Notre Dame de Paris is intertwined with a lot of uh, um, other uh, Written pieces of Hugo. Uh, this is an ongoing topic uh, for in the the, um, uh, the restoration and the uh, preservation of architecture. Uh, this is uh, so the book. It, it is said in the note uh, at the beginning of the book. Uh, it, it, this is an added note of the fifth edition of the book in the in the later editions uh, that he aimed for uh, a sort of uh, an engaged. Uh, 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 how, how can I? Uh, that he aimed for uh, for a, even political discourse as, as a way of stimulating his his fellow contemporaries to look at uh, Paris uh, as uh, uh, the way the way he look at, he looks at architecture. I don't know if if it was the, the base of your question, uh, but. Uh, what what does he gain for his own writing was yeah because because you have this kind of contrast in the book stated that yeah. uh, architecture sorry um, he is superior yeah. to the book which is including at the same time he's writing the book yeah. he's, he's, yeah. he's creating yeah. as you okay. say okay. he's kind of creating a story or a cathedral of his own yeah. so um, what um, aspects of architectural storytelling uh, well, that, I, that does he gain from his writing? Yeah. But well, I I I never looked at it this way of, of an architectural storytelling. I think it's an interesting look at it. I I, I don't know like, on the spot what to do with it, so I won't try to uh, try to uh, skate my way around, around it. But uh, it's uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, as Ken is writing, learn learn from yeah. uh, the the way architecture operates. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I do think there is something really important there because yes, Hugo is building a monumental work yeah. of art himself. There's a matter of construction. There's a contrast. Notre Dame de Paris is not a uh, gothic, not roman. There's something that I think that goes very well in the terminology. It's, it's not for uh, architecture. Architecture is a perfect model to follow for his own type of writing. It's not painting, it's not music, yeah. it's a total thing. Yeah, just uh, keeping on this uh, question of architecture and writing, uh, you know that uh, it's something. Uh, which uh, on, on which I, uh, I've worked a little bit and, uh, um, and just introducing the digital uh, stuff where uh, the the architectural um, meaning of writing is uh, is uh, emerging uh, in a very strong way in my opinion so uh, writing is more and more uh, building uh, something mm -hmm. and building something in an architectural way so i would say that uh, it's wonderful the, this this passage of uh, um uh, you were cited uh, quoting uh, of uh, notre dame de paris uh, about the cathedral and so on was the the thing that struck me uh, more of, of the book uh, when i read it the first time and i think uh, there is something uh, in this relationship between architecture and uh, and uh, writing which was already there when uh, 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 Hugo was writing, and so this idea that uh, uh, writing and especially novels uh, have uh, taken the place of architecture. If you read, if you read Valerie, uh, 
um, and um, Palinos uh, El Architect, there is the same idea. Um, arch architecture is better than, uh, than writing because writing is dead and architecture is alive. And now uh, the, the idea of uh, architecture and writing is emerging again with the uh, digital uh, uh, writing. So uh, I think there is a link uh, to do there. And I think that nostalgia could uh, uh, play uh, a role because it's something which is coming back actually. But coming coming back uh, again and again because uh, we have, uh, I think we have always this feeling that we are losing something uh, when we are going to uh, a writing model that you can find it in uh, Plato of uh, 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 Phaedrus and uh, you can find it in uh, Hugo Discourse, which is paradoxical because he's writing actually. And, and, uh, and then you can find it uh, today uh, with uh, digital writing. So it's just a comment, but... Um... Yeah. Uh, yes. Please uh, elaborate on the notion of digital writing. Because I didn't really see the connection with what you're going to teach. Oh yeah, with the, the the last thing I said with the the, the thing. Yeah, this 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 is really interesting. In fact, because um, this is what we could call a glitch in the in the work of adaptation, because it is said in the Pandora Bari, uh, Hugo praises Vandals, uh, calling them barbaric creators uh, for uh, because. Uh, he sees in uh, their uh, their imprint in uh, the, the the architecture of Notre Dame. So he, he, and he compares the, this barbaric creation to the work of academics that he despises uh, because uh, because of uh, all this uh, all these uh, these uh, comments on restoration and and their their uh, affection for plaster that is that he also despises. Yeah, yeah. So. But Clamondon, when he's adapting the novel, the vandals here are the destructor. So this is, uh, this is, uh, yeah, those are the the little, um, <laughs> those are the little glitches that uh, that really sparks a lot of this, the uh, a lot of um, discussion between uh, uh, the the, adapt, uh, the adapted object and the original object, and we see. Uh, through, uh, through these these, uh, these little uh, differences, uh, the work of mediation. We also find that a kind of fascination for the Gulfs, uh, for, the, for, for the Gulf invaders uh, in Andrzejit, uh, I think of uh, Le Moralis, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, where there is a, a clear like um, a contempt for, uh, for, for linear scholars or academia. And there was this kind of glorification of uh, destructive figures like Atalaric, and uh, we also talked a lot about that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Jean-François? Or for any other of the, the three uh, the four members that we heard today? Maybe there might be common questions or an aspect that was particularly relevant in Session. Yes. Well, you said, Jean Francois, you said that nostalgia was an act of mediation. And I would like to know what you think about this, <laughs> this specific <laughs> expression. Um, yeah, the notion of dynamics gets a bit back. Uh, I like the idea of the dynamic because nostalgia is cyclical. It's not always there, and sometimes we are nostalgic. Some people are never or not at all. And nostalgia is not always the reason why there might be, in this case, maybe, but why there is an adaptation, for example, or that you go back to something. It's not always the something this is triggered by nostalgia, but maybe it would um, yeah this I would yeah say dynamics by the idea of being it as why seeing it as a practice, not only a feeling. So then this is why I took back the the notion from. Um, uh, the journalist Tierney from the New York Times, he used it in, in an article, what is nostalgia good for, and to use the idea of nostalgizing, mm -hmm. so to, to, that it gets out of the state of being, but being a real activity. So I think um, this is what you always, well, well, I would try to say by dynamics yeah. of nostalgia. Then you have, you have Richard Grains who wrote about moods, uh, moods of nostalgia and mm -hmm. modes. And then also Frederick, Frederick Jameson mm -hmm. in his postmodern critique, he got back to this also, but I think finally that 
authors um, like Jameson, but also Baudrillard were a bit nostalgic themselves. The real nostalgia, not the one they were criticizing. So I think we get back like um, um, a bit into this and maybe the intermediality, because this is also why in the beginning was, hmm, uh, this is a really interesting call for papers. But then, then I was more thinking about the, authentic, the question of authenticity when I was um, the work I done on nostalgia, because I've never really pointed it out in, in this sense. And, what I think is interesting with the intermediality, but all what we were saying during the whole conference is that by the fact that it's an accumulation or a possible accumulation, because a lot of things are ephemeral, but still the, um, the archive on the one hand, but also the possibility of accessing so much content in a digital way gives more and more opportunities maybe to be nostalgic, to nostalgize and to, I think it is an eternal, an eternal battle against death and our, the fact that we will die one day. So I, sorry to say it like this, it's like not so encouraging, but I think uh, a lot of in these nostalgic dynamics about the idea, so we want to, to leave something, not just avoid, it's all about loss. We mentioned loss before, so I think there is in this nostalgic dynamic, and then the idea with melancholia and um, depression is that sometimes nostalgia can go more to this melancholic and depression sense, and then you're, your nostalgia is always orientated where the past and doesn't really help you to to cope with, with the crisis or whatever. And then it can be in another point. It's an it's alphabet journal they just published um, about anachronisms, uh, and uh, there um, to show that it's always in a re. re I, I like the way the introduction was done by uh, Kaudoro and I forgot Bashera. I think it's my name. Bashera. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, that they, they talk about a sort of renegotiation with the past for the future. And I think intermediality is also about this. Um, I don't know if this answers the question, but I think the idea of a dynamic is all this. Yeah. Is what well, well you're actually, to say. the question was about the act of mediation. Okay. Not, yeah. not about the dynamics. So, so, this expression, would you say nostalgia is an act of mediation since you were. It can be, yeah. 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 So sorry, my answer was completely. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it was interesting. I, I saw the dynamics in what he was saying about the mediation. <laughs> yeah. I think you called it in your presentation a mediated process. It depends on who is doing it. Are you doing it yourself? Uh, what what mm. is concerned? Is it the content? Is it the production of the reception of the mm. trigger? So it always depends on the perspective. Mm. Yeah. Um, a question about something you, uh, nobody of you uh, mentioned or thematized, but uh, but I think it's uh, uh, kind of when Elizabeth was talking, I was thinking about that, is um, the fact that uh, coming back is uh, uh, never, uh, is not enough. You have to recognize uh, that you are home. And actually in the Odyssea, this, this, this is central. How can you recognize? I was thinking home. about uh, uh, the prestige. Home. And, uh, uh, and you are so the fact that you something uh, uh, something vanished and then uh, you, you you have to make it uh, come back. So um, what and there is something perhaps in, in the selfie too of uh, recognition. I have to to recognize myself. So uh, and in this idea of yours that uh, the, the idea of mediation uh, nostalgia as a, a, a uh, uh, mediation structure or as a uh, metaphor of, uh, of mediation and this uh, phase of recognition could you uh, tell, uh, tell us something about that uh, I, I, I think in, in uh, La Femme de Paris um, this, this is what is uh, uh, really interesting about this immediate writing that Hugo aims for it, it, when we, when he, he, he writes the chapter uh, Paris through a bird's eye, uh, he, take, he, he takes us through the streets of Paris, and he goes, okay, so this this is where uh, we, you see a dog there, and then right by it there is uh, uh, a Mardian, and then you mm -hmm. pass by it. So there is not, like I said, hesitation. Not, you could see no, no, there is. It. So there's really this, uh, this, and so when you say recognize. This is a, a, a comparison, mm -hmm. uh, but the comparison is okay. Well, but well, at the, as at the time as he says those things, those things appears. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Paris, uh, the, the the 15th, the, the referent uh, of of this uh, this uh, this Paris is the book itself. It's the writing itself. Mm -hmm. So the 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 the, the, the like you, you said, the recognition. Is the, the comparison is is one, uh, 
the, the, the city and the time are, are intertwining right? Anyone else wants to? Um, yeah, I think the idea of recognition is important for the selfie because um, when you stop taking a selfie, it's because you finally recognize yourself and you finally like the way you look in the image. Um, or maybe not recognize yourself, but yeah, like, like what is being shown. Um, but I think it's fleeting. And that also explains sort of the impulse to constantly take more selfies and it's an ongoing process. Um, so I don't know if that's also the case in nostalgia with that coming home. Like if there is a recognition and if that recognition can go away um, and if it's a constant process, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I think the selfies in this sense something you try on your own to create um, something of an otherness at the same time, being yourself. I, I think a bit of what you're saying about uh, what Ricoeur is saying about XCT in the end of uh, Toy C, you know, he's really saying this in this sense. And it reminds me all the time, I, I, maybe you saw all of you saw Mad Men and uh, the final episode of the Carousel. And Donald, I use it for the students all the time. I, I, really, I really like this episode because Donald Draper is showing the Kodak, you know, and it's all about time and space and he uses in a very bad way nostalgia actually the screenwriters were not really good with this but <laughs> he's, saying, uh, he's showing the pictures of his own past and he's saying um, I, I wrote it down here because i think i think he i'm not sure if it's exactly what he's saying but he said it takes you back to a time and a place there where you were loved so it is about of being together with others of course and recognition not only in the sense of but also reconnaissance Mm -hmm. And uh, then when he goes back to the places where he came from and shows it to his children, I think everybody knows this when we go back to places where we were ch child and you're like, that changed so much. Oh, nothing has changed here. So we are always in this, and, in, and this goes back to the idea of dynamic and that it is never, because it is this ir irreversibility of time, I guess, which is also behind the, the selfie, because when it's instantly taken, yeah, so you need to take another one and another one. And, yeah, well, you were the specialist of the <laughs> me uh, of the yeah. of the selfie. So I don't know then if it's about nostalgia in this sense. Maybe later will we be nostalgic mm. of our selfies? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have time for more questions on Shadow? Because it's, I think we, one, one one last year. Yeah. Uh, I, I I had a question about the going back to mediation. Um, See it very interesting and clearly that he's kind of using the, the nostalgia in order to say something about his own present. So my question would be now looking for the digital nostalgia. What is the what would that mean? The, the, does the digital nostalgia for, for, for mean what why what's it saying to us now? Uh, which type of digital nostalgia? You mean the nostalgia for the digital yeah. or the expressions of nostalgia in the digital? No, no the, 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 the expressions of nostalgia, uh, the nostalgia for the digital, for the early digital. What this could mean in the case of uh, Ibu? No. Then I will say, I'm the answer to this question. No, no, no. 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 Well, I have the impression that it simply means simply. I we start now interviews with people who are those amateurs of nostalgia, so I think there's empirical work to be done. It's very nice to talk about nostalgia when you want to uh, analyze it in a more uh, ethnographic or anthropological way. But um, I think it is more about the idea that there's an accumulation of time that you see that even the digital gets like an historical density for our everyday life, not only like in the idea of an archaeology of media and the institutions and economics behind, but also in our everyday life and that there is still material and it's not all about something which is completely immaterial and and then we talked about this a lot i tried to get the entrance via the nostalgia and the temporality but i think this is what is shown with it there's a density comes up and then oh no we have to archive i mean this is um the institut national Visuel. they start now archiving or the when there was a library of congress about what kind of tweets are we gonna archive i think there's a, something about this and then that we feel that still there is can could be something lost of a Past, which is now a past that we thought in the present would be completely ephemeral. I don't know if this is. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, I wanted to try to uh, bring together in a kind of vulgar fashion the two topics, and I just just wonder about the nostalgia of, uh, of the selfie. Um, <laughs> first, I did think whether whether the selfie will be something in nostalgia, but whether if the, we are in what Simon Reynolds calls Reckonania, we we should already be nostalgic about old selfies, you know, with the way in which last year's selfies will give us a warm feeling of something like uh, nostalgia, and then. And it, but also it seems to me that something about the selfie, to me at least, has always seemed kind of old, has always seemed nostalgic, partly because of uh, what, what we heard about it. It does resemble previous forms, um, but it is also something new. It's new enough to become a new word, but it seems like quite an old way of making images. And I'm, I was wondering if it, it might be a form of nostalgia, first of all, for the still image, because it emerges at one phase in the at the, the moment when the, the digital video and digital stills are no longer entirely distinguishable in terms of what machines they're made of. Uh, and uh, so maybe it comes up points in that and still and it's so as such it would be a kind of form of return of posing in the face of sort of capturing what you described as symptomatic sign. Uh, and, and it also seems to come at the moment when uh, we learn because if the front facing camera is what makes something itself in I agree we've got to make a distinction other kinds of self portraiture. Um, the front facing camera is also the part of a moment where we realize that, that we're being filmed all the time and spied on all the time. It's almost exactly that moment of prism of all of those things. So, this front facing camera, it's a conspiracy theory, but it's also kind of true, <laughs> it's supposed to be filming us uh, all the time. I wonder if the selfies are kind of a, a response uh, to that. Yeah, sort of providing agency. Um, yeah. Where we can sort of take. Take control of representational practices and photograph ourselves I kind of hope it's the that way we want versus. I hope it's that, yeah, exactly, because otherwise it's the it's been used as when these sort of anti millennial, anti kind of masturbatory mm -hmm. discourses about mm -hmm. self the idea of this narcissism mm -hmm. have been saying, oh, people are prepared to do surveillance on themselves. They're so stupid. Yeah. That, and I, I don't want that to be, mm -hmm. I'd rather it be the kind of means by which the, the yeah. capture of the still was being. Uh, and seems. I think when you talk about nostalgia for the still image, um, I think there's also a certain nostalgia for having fun with photography. Um, I think Kodak was very much about family moments and parties. Um, the Polaroid was about that as well. It was, it was the party camera. Um, I think the selfie is also linked to the photo booth and performing <laughs> You know, and there's a resurgence of the, these photo booths now at weddings or whatever, where people like to perform with props and stuff like that in front of in front of the camera. So, yes, I think there is sort of that surveillance trend, but then there's also um, play and having fun with photography, and the selfie is part of that sort of lineage as well. So we're going to go pose for the picture, <laughs> coffee break. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this very interesting session.